The wind bites hard. Snow drifts, press against a long, low house. No heaters, no humming wires, only bark earth fire and people who understood winter. On nights when breath turns to frost at the doorway, families still lay down to sleep, not in fear, but in order. The room is dim. An ember glows like an eye under ash. A dog sighs. The air is cold near the door, warmer toward the center. Someone adjusts a mat. Someone listens to the draft. Nothing here is random. How did they do it night after night storm after storm? The answer is not one thing. It is many small wise things working together walls that behave like storage bedding that traps air heat that moves where it should and bodies arranged like a living shield. This is Native American winter logic, quiet, exact, tested by time. Stay with me. We will open each layer one by one. Winter on the northern woodlands is not gentle. The snow arrives early. The nights stretch long. Wind moves through trees like a slow river. In this place, homes were built to stand with the weather not against it. Among the Haudenosaunee and the Northeast families shared long bark-clad houses set in rows along a cleared path. Inside, there was order sleeping platforms along the sides, hearths spaced down the center aisle, storage above. Nothing wasted, nothing left to chance. The house skin came from the forest elm or other bark cut, softened, and layered. The frame was bent from young trees. Joints were lashed, not nailed. The shape was long for a reason it carried heat along its spine, and it kept people together where warmth could be shared. Doors were small to hold heat. Vents above the hearths were opened or narrowed by hand, by feel, by reading the wind. This was daily knowledge, not a rare secret. Winters varied across the continent, and homes did too. On the northwest coast plank, longhouses of cedar faced wet ocean storms. In the subarctic birch bark was prized for its dry strength and flexibility. But our focus stays with the bark longhouse of the northeast, where deep cold and long nights shaped a careful way of living. Here, survival felt like craft. It moved in routines, gather wood, tend coals, hang mats, dry clothing by steady heat, check the vents, settle the children. Precision lived in small acts. When we say Native American winter skill, we are not naming a single method. We are pointing to systems made from place which tree stands on a south slope, which bark holds, which cracks, how smoke rises on a still night where the draft sneaks under a door. People learned those answers by watching, then by repeating the right moves through generations. The house became a partner. It stored what the fire gave it, breathed it slowed the loss of heat. The people in turn listened and adjusted. Picture a night before a storm. Clouds low, the air heavy. An elder tests the vent. With a hand feels, the pull shifts a panel the width of a palm. Children's bedding lies ready grass mats fur kept dry off the earth. A dog curls near a post. Coals are banked. The house waits, steady. What makes this work? Not one trick. A set of linked choices, each, small, each, exact. In the next part, we lift those choices into view one layer at a time. The secret begins with what holds the wind back. A wall to most eyes is just a wall. But in a Native American longhouse, it was alive breathing, storing and releasing warmth like a slow heart through the night. Each bark panel cut from elm or cedar carried its own purpose. The outer bark met the storm, shedding snow and rain. Beneath it, a dry inner layer trapped air the way feathers trap heat. Between them, invisible spaces, pockets of still air became nature's insulation. These weren't decorations or guesses. They were lessons earned from generations of winters. By day, 
The fires along the central aisle burned bright. The walls drank in that heat like the sun drinks water from a river. By night long after the flames dimmed, the bark gave it back slowly, softly keeping the space just warm enough for sleep and survival. Inside, woven mats hung along the walls, stopping drafts before they could cross the room. The air near the ceiling stayed warm. The smoke, guided by open vents, escaped in a steady ribbon that marked safety, not waste. The fire itself was never random. It had to breathe, but not too much. Ashes banked over embers held life through the darkest hours, glowing unseen until dawn. When the family stirred a breath of air, a flick of a stick and flame returned as if waking from a dream. Below, heat traveled through the earth floor, absorbed by clay that held warmth like a hidden reservoir. Sometimes stones heated by the coals were carried to sleeping spots. They glowed faintly under mats of grass and cattail radiating comfort without flame. Above, smoke created a thin layer of trapped warmth near the roof, acting as insulation before drifting out through the vent. What looked like a flaw to outsiders, a smoky house was actually part of the system. The house and the fire worked together, each balancing the other. The result. A world inside that felt calm, even when the world outside froze. To survive here was not luck. It was the art of paying attention to bark, to air, to flame, and to silence. When winter deepened and rivers froze hard enough to sing, warmth became a shared creation. Every part of the longhouse had a job. Every person, too. At night, the house was never silent. You could hear the wood breathing the crackle of coal under ash, the rustle of a cattail, mat the low sigh of a sleeping dog. The fire was the heart, steady and slow. Its heat spread through the clay floor and bark walls wrapping families in a quiet circle of safety. But warmth came not only from the house. It came from people who understood how to live within it. Families arranged their bedding in layers dry grass on the bottom, woven mats above, and furs on top. Each layer trapped air, just as the house itself did. The smallest children slept at the center, the oldest at the edges protecting the group like living walls. In that formation, no one was alone against the cold. They wore layers of hide and fur the same way they built their homes with logic. A soft layer close to the skin, a thicker one over it, and then outer coverings that blocked wind and moisture. Each garment served a purpose, moccasins lined with grass mittens from fur turned inward, head wraps pulled tight. They moved easily, even in snow. The design of their clothing like their homes was knowledge carried in memory, not in books. Fires were banked with care before sleep. A handful of ash smothered the flames, but kept the heart alive. By morning, coals were waiting warm enough to spark new life. The elders called this the night fire's breath. Dogs curled beside sleeping places, not as pets, but as companions of heat. Their thick coats shared warmth with the youngest sleepers. The breath of people and animals together warmed the air itself, turning the coldest hours into bearable ones. This was more than shelter. It was harmony, wood earth, and body tuned to the same rhythm. Modern builders talk of efficiency. These people practiced it without machines. Everything was local. Everything was known by touch, by trial, by listening to the whisper of the wind through bark. They didn't conquer winter. They joined it. And in that balance lay their greatness. Time changed, and with it, the way people looked at the land. When metal stoves arrived and later concrete walls and oil heat, many of these quiet systems were forgotten. The world began to favor speed over rhythm, noise, over silence. But in that trade, something ancient went missing. Across the northeast, the old bark longhouses disappeared first. They didn't collapse, they were replaced. 
One by one, the last ones rotted back into the soil they came from. No one thought of them as technology. They were called primitive shelters, not living machines of balance. The language itself began to change, and with it memory. Some tribes held the knowledge in stories. Elders spoke of how the fire had a spirit, how its breath needed space, and how the walls must be treated as part of the family. The younger ones listened, but the world outside moved faster each season. Roads replaced trails. Iron nails replaced sinew. Warmth came from things that could be bought not built by hand. Soon, even the smell of wood smoke in winter, the scent that once meant safety, was replaced by the dull hum of electric heat. The sound of coals shifting under ash faded. Houses stood sealed, no longer breathing. Yet the loss wasn't only of a building. It was the fading of an idea that warmth can be shared, that survival can be designed with care and patience instead of consumption. The logic that kept people alive for centuries was dismissed while its results comfort community balance were quietly missed. Today, when historians dig for answers, they find pieces of bark, bits of clay floor, the outline of a hearth, long cold. What remains is not just evidence of how people lived, but of how they thought. They didn't divide survival from spirit or function from feeling. To them, a house was not protection from nature, it was a conversation with it. The snow still falls where those houses once stood. The same winds still circle the trees. And if you stand in that silence long enough, you can almost hear the breath of those fires, the sound of knowledge that once lived in every wall. Not all knowledge disappears. Some waits buried quiet until the time is right to be remembered. Today, across the northern forests, that remembering has begun. Historians, builders, and tribal elders have started walking old ground again, reading soil patterns, charcoal marks, and half-buried stones where hearths once burned. From these fragments, they rebuild not for museums, but for life. Young carpenters bend saplings the way their ancestors did. Children help strip bark their hands, learning the same rhythm that shaped shelter centuries ago. When the fire is lit, they watch the smoke drift, testing the air, adjusting the vent until it flows just right. The old system breathes again. Modern science now confirms what the ancestors already knew. Thermal studies show how layers of bark create natural air gaps that trap warmth as effectively as engineered insulation. Moisture-resistant cedar performs as well as modern vapor barriers. Fire banking the old ash-covered ember matches the efficiency of slow-burn stoves. Engineers call it passive design. The elders simply call it the right way to live. And so, a bridge forms. Some eco-builders now study longhouse principles to inspire sustainable homes using earth floors, thick walls, and smart airflow rather than energy-hungry systems. They see how a structure can work with the season instead of against it. But the real rebirth is not about architecture. It's about understanding connection again. The people who once shared warmth inside those longhouses remind us that survival is not a contest. It's cooperation between wood and flame, between people and the cold, between past and present. To speak of Native American survival today is to speak of wisdom that still matters, that warmth is not only temperature, it's relationship. It's the quiet knowledge that every layer, every gesture, every shared breath has purpose. When the wind howls across the modern plains, that same logic endures. Keep the fire breathing, keep the air moving, keep each other close. What was once seen as primitive now stands as prophecy, a guide for living gently with a fierce world. The winter sky glows faintly. Snow drifts close the paths, but inside the circle of firelight, everything still breathes. The house, the people, the silence between them.
What began as survival became knowledge-knowledge that still has something to teach. Every ember, every vent, every woven mat was a note in the same song of endurance, and that song has not ended. It waits in the forests and the wind, and in those rebuilding what once kept life alive through the coldest nights. If this story moved you, stay close. We are rebuilding these ancient ways, testing them, and learning again from those who came before. Because the old designs still whisper answers to modern questions how to live simply gently and together. This is Native American wisdom warmth as a form of respect.